First off, Mad Gamer Props, if you can name the video game song that I used in my intro there. That'd be really cool. Oh, and got another Rush shirt on, this time from the Vapor Trails Tour. And uh, as you can see here, I've also got a lapel mic, maybe to help address some of the audio issues that I've uh, read about in the comments. Uh, I, I knew eventually the jacket would come in handy. Many of the comments in my other videos have asked me to provide a little bit of insight or commentary into what it's like to work in the video game industry. People want to know about everything from how to break into game development to what different jobs there might be to uh, what sort of schooling I should have, uh, what it's like to really work in the industry, or even commentary along things like why do broken games ever get released, which is what I'm going to talk about today. As I've said before, I'm hoping to make my games videos as much of a dialogue as possible. So with this video, I'm starting a new series that I'm calling Behind the Screens. See what I did there? Where I'll try to pull back the curtain and uh, demystify what really goes on in the game industry. To that end, I intend to informally share my thoughts as a developer about whatever topics you guys seem the most interested in. So back on topic. Why do broken games get released? I want to break up my response to that into three parts. First, I'm going to give you a bit of background to how game releases actually work and why the current system allows and even sometimes encourages unfinished or broken games to be released. Second, I'm going to talk about how this situation applied to everyone's favorite disappointment of 2016, No Man's Sky. And then third, I'm going to make some suggestions as to what you, the gamer, can do to help to mitigate this problem in the future. All right, so starting off, part one, the business of game releases. Now, in my Gamergate video, I talked a little bit about how publishers, press, PR, and developers all interact. I want to revisit that discussion a little bit so you can get an idea of how each of these groups, in just trying to do their job, can kind of conspire to create this perfect storm such that a broken or unfinished game actually gets pushed out the door. Of course, every game release is its own story, but here is generally how it all goes down. First, we have the publisher. The publisher is the money side of the equation. They are the ones who front the money to pay all the people who make, market, sell, and distribute the games. Their number one concern is that they are trying to make money. Their entire existence revolves around figuring out how to maximize their return on investment, or ROI. Most major publishers reside under an umbrella of an even larger organization. For example, when I worked for uh, Disney, I was actually part of a smaller division, there you go, called Disney Interactive, which represented the publishing interests. Other publishers might include Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, Electronic Arts, etc. The really important thing to recognize about publishers is that their success revolves around their ability to report that they are making money. And because of the way markets work, this means that they have to report on how they're doing every quarter, which is every three months. If a given publishing division is not reporting regular profits, it'll start to look like it is losing money, and that can lead to all sorts of things, like management changes or restructuring or whatever. This means that publishers have a major interest in trying to schedule the releases of their games so that they even out and give them as many profitable quarters as possible each year. This also means that publishers want to invest as little money as possible in each game and release them just as soon as they possibly can. Now here's a little secret. Sometimes publishers will use a dreaded term when it comes to evaluating when and whether or not a game should be released. They call it an MVP estimate, or Minimally Viable Product. What they mean by this is, what is the least expensive game that they can release in the shortest time frame that will still make enough of a splash in the marketplace to return a profit on the money they've invested into its marketing and its development? Time is money, so they generally don't want to hold back a game from release unless they absolutely have to. This means publishers are the primary source of the pressure to get games to market. On the other hand, the developers who are making the games are almost always big fans of games themselves. They want to keep tweaking and tuning and improving whatever game it is that they're working on. Game development is exceptionally hard, 
because unlike movies or music, it is an interactive form of entertainment that requires a player to participate with it. This means that it is impossible to truly evaluate a game's quality until it is playable. And making a game better and better requires a cycle of adding in new features, trying things out to see what works and what is broken, and then going back to fix it up. Most developers really care about the quality in their games, and they can sometimes get so wrapped up in constantly improving things that they get stuck in a cycle of feature creep. Meanwhile, the publisher is glaring over the developer's shoulder, knowing that every day spent iterating on the game is more money coming out of their pocket, which means more reporting quarters going by when they don't have a release, which means more and more risk that the game is going to be profitable for them at all. Often, you'll end up with some very real tension between developers trying to cram in just as much new and better stuff into their games as those milestone dates and ship dates get closer and closer, and the publishers, on the other hand, are trying to lock down the game and push it out the door. Eventually, the pressure gets high enough that the publisher may decide that it's going to ship a given title no matter what its state it's in, just so that they can recoup as much of their investment as they can and make a better quarterly report. So there's a joke among developers that goes something like, in my career, I have shipped a lot of games, but I have yet to have ever finished even one. Over the years, as the game industry has grown, two more pressures have been added into the mix. The first is that publishers have realized that the data shows that games tend to follow a sales curve that is very much like what we see with movies. That is, most of the money made in both a movie or for a game tends to happen immediately within the first few weeks of its release. Many, but not all games, wind up being kind of disposable in this aspect. You'll see a huge marketing hype to build up interest followed by a big release. There will be a big rush to buy the game, and then sales will rapidly tail off as players go looking for the next big thing. Again, very much like movies. Publishers are smart in their money-making schemes, so they know that the bigger the hype is that they can build around a game, the bigger initial sales that they can push. There's no reason not to inflate the hype of a game, just like there's no reason to hold back on the hype surrounding a movie. Get those sales to hit just as hard as you can. However, in games we have a unique pressure that you don't see in movies, and that is that most games can be fixed or patched or improved upon their release because of the widespread use now of digital distribution. Now this didn't used to be the case when games came pressed on disc or in cartridge form. Back then, what you had in the box was what you got. It was too late to fix anything, and so in my view, the bar for allowing a game to release to the public was much higher because it couldn't be patched. But now you can. You can patch pretty much everything you make. So both publishers and developers can talk themselves into a situation where the publisher very much wants the game to come out with the dates of their big hyped up marketing campaign, so they're kind of willing to let the game go before it is truly ready because they know it can be patched. On the other hand, the developer also knows that they can patch a game after its release, so they'll talk themselves into going along with the publisher and push it out for release as well. They'll say, we'll just have a day one patch to fix these known problems so that the publisher can meet their marketing campaign and release the game on schedule and get some of their money back. So, bam, there you have it. You can easily wind up with this perfect storm of pressures from all sides to get a game out before it is thoroughly tested and really ready for release. Now because my career has been on the development side, it may sound like I'm putting most of the blame on the publisher for trying to push games out before they're ready. But honestly, that's not really fair. Developers are gamers ourselves, and we wind up being our own worst enemies. We always want to stick in another cool feature, or fix another rare bug, or update the art, or the audio, or improve balance or gameplay. And the bigger the game, the more feature-rich and prone to these cycles of iteration it can be. If we didn't have publishers breathing down our necks, we might not ever ship anything and just burn money forever. Experienced game developers have learned how to much better estimate how long it is going to take for something to get designed and built and implemented and tested in order to meet a given release date or deadline. Even then, it's really hard to do. There are just so many variables. I mean, even doing something that seems like it should be no big deal can prove to have surprising consequences and introduce new bugs or balance problems. Sure, you've seen this yourself. 
One of the scariest things in development is when you're about to ship a title and someone on the development team reveals that they just slipped something in that should be safe. This is the reason why we have code and content lockdowns where you sometimes literally have to send developers home or threaten their jobs just to call the game done and leave the damn thing alone. But what about indie studios that may not have as much experience? Well, to me, it seems that they almost always overestimate what they can reasonably do. They tend to be starry-eyed idealists who have these great ideas about what they want in the game, and then they think, usually very sincerely, that they can get all or most of those grand ideas in before they have to release it. All right, so what happened with No Man's Sky? I think that by almost any measure, this hugely hyped game really let most players down. By now, you probably have a pretty good sense of how I think it happened. Now, I wasn't part of the development or the publishing process at all, but as a developer, I started to suspect that the hype that was being built up around the game wasn't being monitored by a public relations team. As I said in my Gamergate video, one of the reasons you have a PR team is to try and keep developers from talking to the press about all the things they'd like to do and instead focus in on what the actual delivered product will be. And as much as we sometimes feel constrained by our PR teams because they force us to practice and recite exactly what we're going to say to the press, and they force us to keep to talking points, they are necessary to manage what gets into the press and by extension, consumer expectations. I know there's a lot of anger directed at Sean Murray because of some of the things he was saying and that contributed to the hype of the game and then the subsequent disappointment. But as a fellow developer, I can see how he got carried away. I don't think he was being deliberately dishonest. I just think he was wrapped up with his enthusiasm about what he sincerely hoped and believed his team could deliver in the time frame that they had. I think that maybe he was kind of feeding into his own excitement about what the game could be, rather than taking a hard look based on experience of what it actually would be. So yes, while he's to blame for much of the hype and subsequent disappointment, I don't think he did it with malicious intent. I also got to say that I'm a little bit disappointed with Sony's response to the No Man's Sky situation. They acknowledged that much of the hype and consequent disappointment surrounding the game was precisely because they didn't intervene with the PR team, but then they make it look like it was all the fault of Hello Games and Sean Murray. Really, a responsible publishing house should have stepped in to mitigate the hype and get expectations back in line for what the release actually would be. But they just seem to let it roll. And why not? If they can recoup their investment money via a big rush of sales, and then they can turn around and pin the disappointment mostly back on the developer, there's not a lot of downside for them. So, yes, Hello Games and Sean Murray overpromised and underdelivered. But don't forget that Sony published the game in the first place in that state. That they need to be held partly accountable as well. Okay, so finally, here are a few of my thoughts about what I think could be done to help with this problem. First, don't buy into the hype surrounding a game release, especially when that game comes from an unproven developer. I know it's hard when you're really excited about something, but whenever you rush right out and buy a game in the first few days of release, you're sending a message to the publisher that the excitement surrounding the game is more important to the sales than is the actual quality of the game. So hold off until the reviews, especially the reviews from your fellow gamers, start to congeal around an assessment of the game's quality. Now, if everyone did this and game sales didn't really pick up until after most of the reviews were in, publishers would be forced to take a harder line on quality. It will force them to be more responsible with what they release and not just hope that they can ride the hype train into profitability. Second, and this one is a bit more optional, wherever you can and only if you want to, help out indie or smaller developers that offer early access or open beta gameplay provided they offer it at a reasonable and much discounted price. The last thing we want is to perpetuate the problem by paying full price for a broken or unfinished game, right? That'll just make the problem worse, so don't do that. Instead, if you find a game that looks promising, 
and they offer an early access price that might be like, say, 30% of what you think the final price will be, then that is probably a good thing. You can kind of look at it as almost an investment plan. When you support a developer in this way, they get money to keep developing and improving the game, and you get sort of a deep discount on their final product. It is potentially a win-win situation. Again, this weakens publisher involvement, and it doesn't work in all cases because you can sometimes throw away money on a game that is total crap. But it is still a good option. Think about it. Which brings me to my third suggestion. As much as you can, be aware of each game's development history and recognize that the reputation of the publisher and the developer matters. Games that come from established development or publishing teams tend to be better upon release. Games that are the second or third in a series are also usually much more stable and polished as well. Also games which have been through public beta phases are almost always much stronger than games that just drop straight into retail channels without some prior public vetting. Think about how solid games from Nintendo tend to be. Part of the reason for this is that because, until recently, they just didn't have much in the way of the capability to patch something after it came out. This meant that they had to hold games back longer until they were more ready for release. Fourth, whenever you hear that a game has been delayed for quality reasons, make it known that you, as a gamer, as a consumer, appreciate that and that you would rather have a better game some months down the line than you would have a broken game now. Whenever I see gamers all up in arms and throwing a fit because a game has been delayed, saying that now they're not going to buy it when it is actually released, I just think they're sending the wrong message. They're playing into the idea that it is okay to release a bad or broken game and maybe patch it later, rather than just waiting until it's ready for release in the first place. Fifth, and most importantly, vote with your wallet. Your money matters. Whenever you get a game that doesn't live up to your expectations, do everything you can to return it and get your money back as soon as you can. Now I know it doesn't always work, and I know that it can be a real pain in your butt, but returns on an unfinished or a broken product are brutal for publishers, and it really hits them where it hurts. Because of all the time and investment they have to put into getting games into the retail chain, each return doesn't just reduce their profits, it actually winds up costing them money. If enough people ask for refunds on a game because it didn't live up to the hype, it can actually turn that hype machine back against the publisher. That kind of consumer revolt is powerful stuff because it forces the accountants to acknowledge that releasing a game in a bad state is bad for business no matter how high the anticipation that the marketing and PR teams and the press may have built up. Okay, so that's it for this video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Oh, and uh, also make sure you tell me down in the comments what you think of this video and what future topics you may like me to uh, cover in the future. Until next time, game on, my friends.